Good evening, sisters and brothers, and welcome to this evening's evening prayer. It is, um, it is Monday evening, Monday the 23rd of October, and we come to the end of another day to give God thanks for his goodness and mercy in sustaining us and keeping us through the vicissitudes of this day. And so let's pray as we we pray for ourselves, we pray for the world, we pray for God's church, for God's people everywhere. We pray indeed for the kingdom of God to come in our world and for God's will to be done here as it is in heaven. Let's pray. O oh God, O oh, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us that this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise, now and forever. Amen. And our psalm this evening is Psalm 127. Psalm 127. So we say the refrain. The Lord shall keep watch over your going out and your coming in. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord keeps the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you hasten to rise up early and go so late to rest, eating the bread of toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his gift. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy are those who have their quiver full of them. They shall not be put to shame when they dispute with their enemies in the gate. The Lord shall keep watch over your going out and your coming in. And glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And our prayer. Lord, you are ever watchful and bless us with your use. As you provide for all our needs, so help us to build only what pleases you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And of course, the psalmist brings the, the idea, unless the Lord builds a house, the laborers labor in vain. Of course, the house as we know from Jesus' teaching, the house is our lives. Remember the parable that Jesus gives us in Matthew 7 about the wise man who builds his house on the rock and the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And Jesus said, this is like someone, someone who listens uh, to his teachings and follows his teachings. Those are the people who build the house on the rock. But those who refuse to follow him, those who do their own thing, those build their house on sand. And, and so the psalmist is, is picking up that theme and saying, unless God is the one who, who builds our house, the house of our lives, we are, we are doomed to fail. Sisters and brothers, and uh, it is, we, we don't, you know, we don't need to look further than the world in which we live to see that that is what happens. There are people everywhere in our world who build, uh, who build on sand, who build their lives, their homes, their houses on their own, on their own wisdom, on their own attitude, their own behavior. And those lives are come crashing down around us, as we can see in the news in the world around us. Unless the Lord keeps the city, 
the watchman watches in vain. Unless God is central, front and center of our lives. You know, this is the thing we keep preaching. I mean, this is what I keep hammering on at that. Unless God becomes the focus, the centrifugal focus of our lives, then our lives are worth nothing. Let's face it. Absolute zero. And as I said, all you have to do is look at the world around us. People don't value life, don't value their own life or the lives of others because their lives are built on their own self-centeredness and their own selfish nature, not on God. Great song, unless the Lord builds a house, everything else is worthless. Unless the Lord watches over the house, the city, the town, the country, everything fails. God has to be taken in a center. Let's move on. I could spend time preaching on that, but we have other texts to preach on this evening as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and be not wise in your own sight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and be not wise in your own sight. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and be not wise in your own sight. All right, let's go to our first reading and leave the red this. Um, 2 Kings 21 is our first reading. 2 Kings 21. And we're reading from verse 1 to 18, 2 Kings 21. We've been looking at the kings of Israel and now the kings of Judah, the southern kingdom. And um, we've come to the life of M M Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh, who is... All right, let's read Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. It's amazing. 55 years of evil in the sight of God. His mother was half. Hephziba, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He rebuilt the pagan shrines his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He constructed altars for Baal and set up an Asherah pole just as King Ahab of Israel had done. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped them. He built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord and place where the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. He built, he built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Um, Manasseh also sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced sorcery and divination, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Manasseh even made a carved image of Asherah, and set it up in the temple, the very place where the Lord had told David and his son Solomon, my name will be honored forever in this temple and in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen from among all the tribes of Israel. If the Israelites will be careful to obey my commands, all the laws my servant Moses gave them, 
I will not send them into exile from this land that I gave their ancestors. But the people refused to listen, and Manasseh led them to do even more evil than the pagan nations that the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel entered the land. Then the Lord said through his servants, the prophets, King Manasseh of Judah has done many detestable things. He is even more wicked than the Amorites who lived in this land before Israel. He has caused the people of Judah to sin with his idols. So this is what the Lord, the, the God of Israel says. I will bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of those who hear about it will tingle with horror. I will judge Jerusalem by the same standard I use for Samaria and the same measure I used for the family of Ahab. I will wipe away the people of Jerusalem as one wipes a dish and turns it upside down. Then I will reject even the remnant of my own people who are left, and I will hand them over as plunder for their enemies, for they have gone, for they have done great evil in my sight and have angered me ever since their ancestors came out of Egypt. Manasseh also murdered many innocent people until Jerusalem was filled from one, from, from one end to the other with innocent blood. This was in addition to the sin that he caused the people of Judah to commit, leading them to do evil in the Lord's sight. The rest of the events in Manasseh's reign and everything he did, including the sins he committed, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. When Manasseh died, he was buried in the palace garden, the garden of Uzzah. Then his son Ammon became the next king. Oh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, now, so as I was mentioning at the beginning, so this this king Manasseh was the king of was the king of the southern kingdom Judah. Uh, the northern kingdom was already destroyed by the Assyrians. The by the um by the Assyrians. Um, remember, Samaria was already destroyed, and this king. Because of his evil, and not just this evil, he reigned for 55 years and did evil things in the sight of God. Now, because he was such an evil king, God has finally decided that he's going to wipe out the people of Jerusalem as well, just as he did with the people of Samaria in the north. And so God is going to bring judgment on the southern tribes on the southern kingdom, in, as, in the same way he brought judgment on the northern kingdom. Uh, the southern kingdom wasn't as bad as the northern kingdom, but now they're getting horribly worse. And Manasseh was the worst of all for 55 years. He not only led the people of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, into idol worship, he set up the um, idols in the temple, in the temple that was meant to be for the worship of God alone. He set up idols in there, um, statues and, 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 and all sorts of detestable things that, that the nations around were worshipping. And Manasseh decided to incorporate all of this worship in the worship with the worship of Yahweh. The God of Israel, and this was detestable before God, because God, the worship of God, cannot be intermingled with any other pagan worship. I've said it many times, sisters and brothers. We, we have to be very careful. We do not mix the the, the God, the the worship of the God of the Bible, with any other God or with any other religious ideas. Uh, God will not accept God's. 
The worship of God must be pure and holy. God will not, God will not accept any other worship other than to him alone. And so when you mix, and that's what uh, uh, Manasseh was doing, mixing and mingling the gods, as it were, and, and introducing all these pagan gods in the temple and giving the, 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 the people of Judah um, this, this admixture of gods. And God, and God was, God was um, angry at what he was doing. He was involved in divination, sorcery, mediums, and, uh, and psychics, and all of these things that God had already um, pronounced judgment on these things and said, these things must not be named among you, but he has brought them into the temple. He's brought them into the life of the community and the people not just that he was he was also a brutal and violent man he killed innocent people he spilled innocent blood which is another way of saying he killed he probably killed children and those is he sacrificed his own son in a fire this is how evil this person was and god says he is not it's not gonna go unpunished because he he led the people of israel into idolatry and violence. So in the land, there was violence and wickedness. Blood was spilled from one end of the, of the country to another because of the evil of Manasseh. And God will judge such evil. It's gonna take time, but it will happen. Eventually, God will bring to judgment all those. Manasseh himself will, died, after 55 years of evil, uh, but it's not going to continue. And eventually God will bring an end to it. Let's leave that there. But we learn from those things, sisters and brothers, because we are to remember that God will not accept any second, any mixture of. And that's why I say sometimes, you know, sometimes you in, in various parts of the world, people uh, people mix the Christian faith with tribal with tribal religion and, and think that that's Christianity. It's not. If you mix the Christian faith with tribalism and your tribal religion and, uh, and so on, that is, not, that is not the Christian faith. That is, that is paganism. And, 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 that must, and that God does not honor that. All right. Our second reading is 1 Timothy chapter 1. From verse 1 to 17. First Timothy chapter 1 from verse 1 to 17. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus who gives us hope. I am writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. When I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations which don't, help, which don't help people live a life of faith in God. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. But some people have missed this whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they are talking about, even though they speak so confidently. We know that the law is good when used correctly, for the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious who are ungodly and sinful, 
who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are, ex who are, who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal King, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Amen. I, I, there's a lot here. In fact, I am, I am currently doing a study on First Timothy, so this is quite fresh in my mind, but I, 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 I'm trying to, as I'm reading, I'm trying to see what can I highlight um, from this. Uh, two things. Paul, the first bit that Paul mentions here is that he's warning. For, okay, so he, he's writing this letter to Timothy. He has placed Timothy as a pastor in Ephesus. And he says to Timothy, this is my charge to you. This is what I want you to do. I need you to root out the false teachings. I need you to go against false teachings. I need you to 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 ensure that false teachings do not enter the church He's, and, and he gives some example of what these false teachers do i can't go through it right now because i don't have the time but he says a number of things they 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 they, they engage in meaningless discussions and 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 things that do not promote love and and a pure heart and clear conscience and genuine faith is another word, sisters and brothers, be careful of certain discussions and, and, and arguments in the church that don't promote love, that don't uh, that 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 do not engage in a pure heart and a clear conscience and genuine faith. You see, these are things Paul said that are unprofitable. They are not worth getting involved in if they do not promote promote love pure heart, clear conscience, and genuine faith. So that's the first thing. Those are false teachers. And Paul says, Timothy is to be mindful of them. Many of them, they, they claim to be experts in the law. They claim to know the law. And Paul says they don't know what they're talking about. And then he makes the point that the law, the law was intended for people who are lawless. <laughs> The law, one of the purposes of the law, it's not the only purpose of the law, but Paul's point is one of the purposes of the law is to point out our, our sin. The law is to show us where we've gone wrong. And so he gives us a, a list of some of the things which, which are really from the commandments, you know. Um, he says the people who kill their, their, their parents, those who are ungodly and sinful, those who are rebellious, those who are sexually immoral, and he speaks of two kinds of sexual immorality. That is um, sexual immorality, in, uh, just engaging in wanton sex acts or actual homosexual acts. And 
you know, we, we live in a society now where we are told that these sex acts are okay now. But Paul says they're not okay because they are, from, they are breaking the law of God. Liars, slave traders, people who buy and sell other people, people who, who, who deal in the, in the slavery, in, 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 in enslaving others. Paul says all of these, all of these are breaking the law of God. All of these, he says, contradict the true doctrine, the wholesome doctrine. In, the, the, in fact, the word, the word that Paul uses, is a good word actually, wholesome means healthy. And what Paul is saying is that these are things that are unhealthy for your soul. These are unhealthy things and, and, and they are not they are not good for your spiritual life. And then the second part is where he, he, he marvels that God could save him, the worst of sinners. Paul says, I am the worst of all sinners because I used to kill God's people. I used to persecute the church of God. And so I, on, in the light of God, I see myself as the most detestable of sinners. And yet God was willing to, to display his grace in me. And he says, this trustworthy saying needs to be accepted by everyone. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Sisters and brothers, <clears throat> we need to hold on to that. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Not righteous, not the good, not the wonderful, not the lovely, not the whatever. Sinners. People who know that they have no hope without God. Are you one of those? I mean, this is, Paul says, I have been the worst. I am the worst of those people. And, and I marvel at the grace of God. He says, and that's why he gives this doxology in verse 17. Uh, um, the, the, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the invisible God, the, the, the immortal, invisible God. He says, the one who is unseen, the eternal king, who alone is God. Amen. He says, that's it. Paul cannot, cannot imagine that he is saved. <laughs> he's amazed. He's, he's marveling that that. He, somebody like him, could be used by God as an example. In, in fact, he says God is using him as an example to show that anybody can be saved. That's basically what he said. If I can be saved, anybody can be saved. And God is using me, the worst of sinners, to show that any sinner out there can be saved. If God could save this, if God could save this one, he can save anybody. And so he marvels at the grace of God. Oh, all honor, all glory be to him forever and ever. The, the eternal king, the unseen king, the, the one who never dies, he alone is God. Amen. I love it. What a powerful. As I said, I'm doing a study on this. That is just a, a taste of First Timothy chapter 1. Let's leave that there. Let's go to prayer. And so, Father, we are grateful that you've chosen us to be your children. We, Lord, you came into the world to save sinners. And as Paul says, I am worse. I am chief. <laughs> Lord, when we, when we look at our own selves, in, in the light of the gospel, we see the darkness of our hearts without you. We know, Lord, that it's a miracle that we are saved. That it is a miracle that we are your children. And so we are grateful that you have saved this sinner. That you have brought this sinner, translated this sinner from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. From being a nobody to being your child. So Lord, what great love. John says, what great love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Hallelujah. And here Paul echoes that same theme. 
such amazing grace to save us sinners. And Lord, we think of the world, a world that is full of sins, who have yet to turn in repentance and be saved. We pray for this world. We look at the sinfulness, the evil, the wickedness in our world. We think of someone like Manasseh who, who was so evil. And he has so many counterparts today in our world. Leaders who do evil things. People in the community who do evil things. Not just spiritually, but physically and emotionally to others. Lord, we pray that, we pray for your grace to save those around us, we pray. To rescue sinners from hell from their own sinful hearts, from their own wickedness, from their own evil deeds. And so, Lord, we pray for the salvation of our world. And Lord, we pray for the end of war and violence in our world. We, we continue to pray for the, the people in Israel and Gaza. God, we ask for an end to the conflict there. We pray for an end to war, Lord. We war is never the best, is never the best way to sort out our problems and solve our conflicts. Lord, we pray for an end to war. For the for the for the the, the unnecessary deaths of children and innocent people in Gaza and in Israel indeed. Dear God, have mercy on those people, we pray. And we pray that somewhere, somehow, we will bring in mediators and peacemakers who will be able to, to bring peace to the Holy Land. Lord, we pray. We ask for your grace. We ask for mercy. And we pray for Ukraine. Again, we pray exactly on the same prayer for Ukraine, for the, for the end of that war, for the end of that uh, conflict between Ukraine and Russia. We pray, we pray, Lord, that you will change that situation, the dynamics of that situation, Lord, so that the, the Russian soldiers will go home. And, 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 and leave the Ukrainian people. And so, Lord, we, we pray. We ask. We ask for your intervention in the affairs of our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And hear our prayer, Lord, as we, we pray for the church as well. We pray especially for the church in lands where... Uh, your your people are being persecuted where it is dangerous to go to church it is dangerous to to make it known that you're a christian we pray for christians who live in such lands we pray and well, lord well, while we do that we thank you we thank you that despite the bro this despite despite the brokenness of our own land of our own country, we are free to proclaim the gospel. We are free to worship. We are free and we are not persecuted to the extent that Christians are being persecuted in so many parts of our world. In northern Nigeria, where Christians every day fear for their lives. In parts of the Muslim world, where Christians and Christianity is suppressed and Christians dare not be vocal about their faith. In Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Iran, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in India, Lord, remember your people in these parts of the world where where various pockets of those societies 
are persecuting Christians or Christians are dare not dare not make themselves known they become secret followers and so Lord we pray for your blessing upon them that they will that they will be safe and that Lord the powers of hell will not be able to come against your church despite the bombardment of of Satan and his forces against your people we pray Lord that you will strengthen your church that we will remain faithful witnesses for you against the onslaught of the evil one that your people in in parts of the world where where their lives are in danger that they will remain faithful and steadfast in their faith and that they will not give in to the pressures around them. As the Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord, as we seek to be the salt and light that you have called us to be right here in our local community. Wherever we are in our Christian faith, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to be the salt and light in our locale, in our community, in our family, May we reflect Christ wherever we are, whatever we are doing, with whomever we are in relationship with. May we reflect Christ to all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord, as we remember those who are suffering and those who are sick and dying, the aged, the, the broken, the weary, the feeble, the weak, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are undergoing treatment for cancer. Lord, you know their situation more than I do. And so Lord, hear our prayer for them and give them strength in body and mind and spirit and draw them into a, into a deeper, more meaningful relationship with you. So that their faith will be stronger in the in the in, in the situation of their weak bodies. May their faith grow stronger. May they grow stronger in spirit, even even as their bodies show signs of weakness. And so, Lord, strengthen them. We pray, strengthen their faith, strengthen their courage, strengthen their resolve, strengthen their their relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Kindle in our hearts, O God, the flame of love which never ceases, that it may burn in us, giving light to others. May we shine forever in your temple, set on fire with your eternal light. Even your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Redeemer. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord watch over you as you sleep. May the Lord grant you his peace and rest tonight, sisters and brothers. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good night, sisters and brothers.